Well, first of all, we have Davo, Davo, who I've known for over 25 years, we're giving away our ages now, um, who is Professor of Gynecology and Director of Gynecological Diagnostic and Outpatient Treatment at University College Hospital, one of the, the finest hospitals in the UK. He's absolutely an internationally recognized expert in gynecological and early pregnancy ultrasound. Davo, uh, I'm really pleased you took time out to come and join us today, so whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for, for, for this kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here today with friends and colleagues. And also I would like to thank all of you around the world for taking time uh, from the weekend and, and the rest and listening to our lectures. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, my um, task for today is to discuss surgical treatment of um, cesarean scar pregnancy uh, with particular reference to what Baski said London experience. Uh, I just for those of you who are not familiar with UK practice, in the UK, we have something called early pregnancy units, and all women who have early pregnancy problems come to a fine place in hospital. They are assessed, scanned, and managed. And my unit, UCH, is one of the largest in the country. We see about eight to 10,000 patient episodes, and, uh, and also the tertiary centers. So we attract referrals from all around the country. So our ability to collect material expertise is very high. And in my practice so far, I manage around 350 scar pregnancies over a period of 20 years. And I'm going to tell you about my journey, how my thinking developed in scar pregnancy, how I came to conclusions about management, day, which I have reached and which I'm using now. So the aim of my talk is to talk about indication for surgical evacuation, a little bit about technique, how to assess preoperative risks, talk about complications, and mention our long-term outcomes. And you have already heard, uh, there are a lot of uh, diagnostic criteria published in literature about scar pregnancy. They all differ slightly, and even uh, top experts, as, as, as we have around the table, use different uh, conditions to, 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 to refer to the same terms in their diagnostic criteria. So there's quite a lot of confusion, and there is no uniformity or agreement, which is understandable, because the reference standard, the diagnostic, standard to, to tell us that we're right or wrong simply doesn't exist. In my opinion, scar pregnancy is defined by the lack of myometrium and lack of uh, decidia at the part of the uterus scar by cesarean section. So to have a scar pregnancy, we have a scar which hasn't healed very well, and the defining characteristic of that scar is the lack of endometrium. And if pregnancy implants there, as we have heard before, quite rightly, majority will miscarry. But those who survive, in order to prosper, have to invade my meteorium and embed deeper in the muscle. Therefore, inevitably, pregnancy is concluded, the risk of bleeding is increased, largely because pregnancies adhere to my meteorium, but also there is lack of contractility at the cesarean section site. The other issue, which has not been discussed so much, is that, that at, when you look at cesarean section scar, it's not just lack of my meteorium, there's a lack of mass, a lack of vascular architecture. In a normal uterus, there is a perfectly organized network which supplies pregnancy, which is developing, starting from uterine artery, arcuate, radial, and spar arteries. In cesarean scar pregnancy, you are often going to see a pregnancy which implants next to uterine artery, logically, because no, there's no lack of small blood vessels. And you can see this very small pregnancy, seven weeks, it attracts blood supply from the uterine art. The uterine art is dilated. I resent using the term avian malformation. This is nothing malformed here. This is just uterine artery responding to powerful vasodilatory stimulus from the pregnancy. And in even this small pregnancy, you can see this massive branch of uterine artery coming into the placenta and supplying it. As a result of, of, of high pressure, placenta develops lacunae. And when this pregnancy is terminated, even if it's very early, the bleeding is going to be very significant. We also heard a lot of discussion about uh, 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 vocational scar pregnancy. Some people uh, call pregnancy close to the scar scar pregnancy. Some people call pregnancy which is over the scar scar pregnancy, below the scar scar pregnancy. I would say this is a car crash. If something is very close to, to, to now the object, it's not necessarily a problem. And I would call this skill parking, as I would call this case as well. Something which is very close to the defect is not a problem itself. If something travels through a canal, it doesn't mean it's going to fall into it. This is a problem. And therefore, to have a true scar pregnancy, there's one most important defining characteristic. Pregnancy has to 
drop into the gap into mammitium. Anything else I think is clinically significant. There's a great danger. If we, if we label these conditions as a potentially dangerous, we are going to terminate a lot of pregnancy, which are not even scar pregnancy, because of fear that something may go wrong. And I had experienced that before. Often people will refer patients, they will ask for advice, and I would say, this is not a scar pregnancy. Pregnancy posterior looks fine. I think we have to terminate anyway because the patient is, 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 is terrified something will go wrong. So, so for those of, 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 of us who advocate screening, you have to be very careful about ending up terminating pregnancy, which are normal. And I, I'm also slightly fearful that in the registry, this type 1 pregnancy, which are classified as scar pregnancy, in my books, they would be perfectly normal pregnancy. So, so, so there is quite a lot of confusion. And before we embark on screening, we have to be very careful that we agree what is right and what is wrong. In the UK, we've been studying this for quite some time, and, and our college, which is very quick to produce guidelines, has come with the criteria for scar pregnancy, which most people now use um, uh, around the country. You, you could hear Amar referring to that as well. And, and, the, and the critical def definition of scar pregnancy is the placenta is at the level anteriorly of, of eternal loss, but it has to be degree of myometrial involvement, which is relatively easy to identify pregnancy, which is going beyond at the medium mammitial junction. I would say the other important feature, in my opinion, is lack of decidua. Normal pregnancy is surrounded by thick decidua layer. Scar pregnancy has no decidua. Decidua is somewhere else. And the blood flow is terribly important. And we had debates with Judith about value of blood flow. I don't think you can diagnose scar pregnancy unless you can use doctor. If you can't use doctor, then you shouldn't be trying to diagnose scar pregnancy. But it's impossible differentiate between true scar pregnancy and miscarriage unless doctor is used to identify blood supply to gestational sac. This is my journey over the last 20, 20 odd years uh, with the scar pregnancy. I started, like most people, uh, fearful of, uh, of the condition, fearful of bleeding, system metotrexate, sit tight, and consider embolization if things go wrong. There's always one case that changes your management, and that was uh, relatively early in my, my interest in scar pregnancy. I had this woman who had two cesarean sections. She, had a, she came for a scan because she had private obstetric care, and they wanted to know if pregnancy is healthy or not. It was, it was a little dead pregnancy in the scar, seven weeks. And I said, oh my God, this scar pregnancy, let's admit you. I'll give you standard sex a couple of doses to bring ACG down. And then she went home and then she came back to casualty, bleeding heavily, once, twice, blood transfusion. I said, let's embolize you because it's getting really serious. So she embolized, she came back to casualty. And I said, this doesn't make sense anymore. Like, why don't you try to evacuate this pregnancy? So I did evacuate this pregnancy. I was quite scared. So evacuation was done under laparoscopic guidance. And when I took it out, I said, that was nothing. That was so easy to remove. Why did I spend month torturing this woman with medication? Why did I spend month dealing with blood transfusion? But I could have done it very easily. And from that moment on, I decided perhaps surgical treatment is a better option. I distended laparoscopy very quickly because uh, there's no need to do laparoscopy if you have ultrasound in, in, in theater. I used folic acid at the beginning, as most people do. It's easy and it's accessible. Uh, I was I found it very hard to dispense with Trexid because uh, everybody likes the Trexid. So I continued with local Trexid for a while. I realized it's useless, doesn't make any difference, doesn't make the operation easier or reduces the blood flow. And then I dispensed with folic acid. I had the first case of sepsis and continuous bleeding afterwards. And I look at the literature and I was thinking, what can I do to, to improve my surgical technique? But before I did that, I said, well, I was definitely stopping the Trexid because using metatrexate makes no sense. Why not? Because it will kill the pregnancy, but the, the, the body, the dead person is going to stay in the scars. They're going to be able to hide it. Pregnancy will stay there because there's no physiological mechanism to get rid of it. And because pregnancy attracts increasingly high blood supply, blood supply increases with time. So something which is a relatively trivial problem to start with becomes a surgical nightmare because blood supply is probably the most powerful indicator of surgical risk when you're dealing with the early uh, scar pregnancies. I uh, have great respect for Judith, but, but, but I was, I'm old school ultrasonographer, early pregnancy specialist. For me, hysterotomy is something I never done, and I would never do hysterotomy for early pregnancy. And I 
respect uh, my colleagues from the 60s in the UK, they used to do termination by, by hysterotomy, and then few people sat down and said, listen, this doesn't make sense, you're doing operations complex, which is, which is dangerous to remove pregnancy, this has to stop. And it has stopped for good, and nobody does hysterotomy for, for, for early miscarriage in, in the UK, unless they want to visit GNC and explain why they're doing this procedure. So this is when I start thinking about alternatives to, to, to Foley and GNC. I thought hysterotomy is just, just out of my, my book. Hysteroscopic section doesn't make sense to me because if there is a bleeding, a large pregnancy, you can't really operate hysteroscopically. There is thin mammitrium as well. You distend it to the blood, so therefore you're, you're, you're making the whole procedure much more difficult. And, uh, and when to treat pregnancy uh, with metabolic evacuation? Well, uh, you should really uh, look at those who have, have heavy and prolonged bleeding, and there is nothing else you can do about it, because when it's bleeding heavily, there's no medical text going to save you, you have to operate. Gestation has to be less than 70 weeks to translate the vacation. Beyond that, it becomes really difficult. Uh, women has to be obviously keen on treatment and has to be fair conservative management. Uh, it is important to recognize that scar pregnancy can be accessible transcervically, but sometimes it is not. And that's the reason why this Asian classification, which has been published very recently, we divide scar pregnancy as partial. The pregnancy is a contact in the canal and uterine cavity and it can be removed using sexual keratitis trans transvically, or the pregnancy is complete within my metrium, and therefore there is no possibility to remove it uh, surgically, and it has to be managed medically, or it's very large, needs trans approach. So the first question you have to ask yourself, if you're planning a uh, uh, trans uh, evacuation, can I access this pregnancy? And these are examples of pregnancy which is added in my metrium, complete in the broad ligament, and in these cases, you cannot evacuate pregnancy. If pregnancy is relatively small and it's alive, you can use methotrexate. I never use methotrexate for many reasons, but it makes women sick. Well, locally, you can use a very small dose of medication. You eject the embryo. It's quite an unpleasant procedure to watch, and you stop heart rate, and that's the end of it. Uh, the problem which we have a, with surgical evacuation is perceived risk of uterine perforation because you are looking at the very thin and the mammitial layer covering pregnancy. You are looking at the risk of incomplete evacuation because it's quite hard to remove pregnancy tissue from an area which is irregular and also women bleed, so you may end up uh, leaving tissue behind, which could be a problem. And sometimes it's quite hard to enter the cavity and clean the cedula because uh, pregnancy is in the way and it's difficult to get past pregnancy into its cavity. Solution to all this is ultrasound guidance, and this is how you do it. We do pregnancy at the transabdominal, or if there are small transectal guidance. Transectal scan gives you the same quality of view as a vaginal scan. You can see an instrument in the cavity very easily. You remove this pregnancy on the direct vision. You will not prefer it because you can see anterior wall of the uterus. When evacuation is finished, you will see how front of the uterus, the wall, it's very, very thin. It moves with the suction, but because you're not going perpendicular to the, to the wall, you're just aspirating it, it's not going to perforate. So this perforation, if you use simple suction, uh, plastic curette, is not going to be a problem. I must say, I never use metal curette in, in early pregnancy, and therefore this instrument is potentially more dangerous. When it's finished, you're left with the problem, Pregnancy is removed, but you're left with a big cavity here, no mitrium, and bleeding. So how to stop this, this bleeding? This is something which, which is a second worry when you think about um, uh, scar pregnancy evacuation. And it's quite a legitimate fear because some pregnancies are really very vascular and look quite unpleasant. So I tried folic at the first as I, as, I, as I did before. I didn't like it as I had sepsis and incomplete success. And I found this paper from group from Israel with Masia, who said we should use Slovakia suture to treat the Slovakia pregnancy, and it seems to work in their hands. They had a few cases, and they said they're very good results. I said, well, that sounds logical. Why is it logical? Because if you use folic catheter, if you inflate it in the cervix, you cause a lot of pain uh, and, and, and incomplete occlusion. If you inflate it higher up, you're going to distend the uterus because there's very little mammitrium around the cesarean scar pregnancy, so you can inflate this balloon 
as far as you like, which is contrary to common sense, what you to be smaller rather than bigger. And secondly, this is very irregular area, often herniates towards side of the road ligament. So therefore, uh, a balloon is not going to occlude effectively all blood vessels. If you use like a suture and you know a little bit of physics, you will know that the pressure in this area, if fluid is occluded, is going to be evenly distributed. So every blood vessel which is in any corner of the irregular sac is going to be effectively uh, stopped. And this procedure I started using about 2003, and I never looked back. Why does it work? It works because you put silica suture in the cervix, and you use it to tonics to create high pressure environment in the cesarean section scar. Although there's no myometrium here, the pressure of blood is going to stop the bleeding. And, and if you look at the end of the procedure, you will see the scar, silica suture in the cervix, there's a cavity, with the blood looks quite dramatic, but this is only is a small uterus as you look at 15, 20 mils of blood at most. And, and, and it works magically because once you tie this silica suture, bleeding simply stops. And which type of suture to use? Well, um, there are two possibilities, McDonald or uh, Shirotka. Masha Hugh Shirotka, I think he was right because suture is smaller, is shorter. You can put it deeper, so it's less tissue between the suture and the silica canal, so you can close, you can get a better, better closure force. Suture is uh, inserted at the beginning of the procedure, it's not tight, and we use muslin tape, so we can use a lot of strength to, 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 to close the cervix. And if uh, there is no bleeding at the end, we simply remove the suture. If there is a bleeding, then we will tie the suture and remove it two days later under local anesthetic. And these are data we published a few years ago on 232 scar pregnancies. Majority of them were managed surgically. And what is quite important to, to, to say, I was glad to, to hear uh, my colleagues talking about the registry. In 50%, there was nothing necessary apart from simple curettage. Early pregnancies, small pregnancies could be removed without need for any complicated procedure. Median blood loss was small, but in some cases it was up, up to three liters. And blood transfusion rates were respectably low, only 4.7%. Bearing in mind that a lot of our patients are coming from other hospitals after previous failed treatment, either medical or surgical, or because pregnancy is very advanced. So they're getting quite a skewed population of difficult cases. I'm going to refer briefly to the um, uh, UK audit of scar pregnancy published a few years ago, which Amar has also mentioned. What we found, the technique I described, is used quite widely in the UK these days. Success rate is very close to 100%, as opposed to medical treatment and, and expected management we have success rates which are much, much lower. Complication rates are lower with surgery than anything else, and, uh, and the residual tissue was a particular problem with the uh, uh, methotrexate. And again, data which I'm glad were confirmed by the registry, methotrexate doesn't work. It doesn't work because if you use it, failure rate is very high and you need the second um, treatment option afterwards. And this second treatment option is often more difficult because you already have tissue which is sitting there for weeks, which is vascular and quite difficult to manage. What is the risk of bleeding with uh, surgical management? Uh, cervical cyclage where it depends on gestational age. It increases with mean gestation, sac diameter and current run plant but the most powerful predictor is vascularity. And if you look at the pregnancy on ultrasound, we use IOTA modified score uh, of, of assessing uh, vascularity using color Doppler for one to four. Even if pregnancy is very small, even if it's not alive, with this blood flow, you're going to face great difficulties. You're going to face great intraoperative blood loss. So vascularity, in my opinion, is the most powerful, most important indicator of risk even bigger than gestational age. If you look at the live pregnancy, the data we collected recently, again, it, I'm glad that the registry works so well because we have shown very clearly, same as you did, that if pregnancy is less CR, less than 60 millimeters, less than eight weeks, there's virtually no risk of excessive blood loss or blood transfusion. So these cases can be managed by somebody who is not particularly skilled but knows how to do DNC and remove the pregnancy, and the risk of bleeding is very low. When you go above that, that cutoff level, risk of transfusion increases progressively. And when you come to 10, 11 weeks, I think that this patient should be referred really 
to very few dedicated centers who can deal with the second trimester scar pregnancy, which requires surgical evacuation. What can go wrong? Well, you can have excessive blood loss, uh, but again, having suture in place is an excellent insurance policy. Blood loss becomes excessive. You can tie the suture, stop procedure, resuscitate the patient, transfuse, and then come back a few days later to, um, to remove the rest of the pregnancy. If cervical suture is not working, which is very rarely the case, I had a couple of cases in the past, you can put another suture above the first one and you will stop the bleeding. I never needed to put a third one. There's another case which, uh, which again changed my practice only a few years ago. Uh, this woman came. She was from north of England. She uh, was 14 weeks pregnant, a young woman, desperate to keep fertility, bleeding for several weeks. Pregnancy was 14 and a half weeks. The cervix was open. She had bled recurrently and the placenta was only one centimeter from the external loss. In that case, I think the chance of this pregnancy progressing is virtually zero. And she opted for termination of pregnancy. When I look at her, my heart sank, not only because it was 14 weeks pregnancy, but because placenta was all full of lacuna, it was degenerating. But when you look at the side of the uterus, placenta was deriving blood supply directly from the uterine artery. We did successful allocation of pregnancy with a very large blood loss. But after the operation, she complained of severe pain. And I took her back to the theater and looked at her, and she was bleeding from the artery, large artery uh, on the side of the uterus into the uterine cavity. And that is, we decided to take for embolization. The vessel was embolized, bleeding was stopped, and eventually she recovered. So from that day onwards, what we are doing, if we finish evacuating a large, a very vascular pregnancy, we continue scanning women with the stitch in situ. If there's a pulsating large artery, we will take them straight to um, our radiology colleagues and they will embolize selectively only one blood vessels. Until now, in the last 20 years, I need to do three cases like that. But nevertheless, it's something which can help you if uh, pressure of blood is so high that of those sutures containing the blood, the pressure is, is, is causing severe pain and eventually suture will give away. Can embolization help in other cases? Yes, it can. This is another example of a woman who came to us. Uh, she went for termination of pregnancy at eight weeks. It was medical termination. It was failure, but failure was not diagnosed until 16 weeks. Then she presented massive blood loss during surgical termination. She had a horoscopy and she continued to bleed. So she came to us and what you could see is the uh, cavity full of blood. If you look a little bit on the side, you will see a uh, Massive blood vessel here on the right side, feeding the cavity. On the left side, small amount of retained products, which you can see by increased blood supply and hardly any tissue. And then if you look here, you can see this massive blood vessel feeding into the cavity. We, um, again, we embolized this patient rather than doing evacuation. Embolization was successful. Uh, bleeding has stopped and small amount of tissue resolved without need for intervention. So embolization was the only thing we needed in this particular case. Uh, another example of a patient who had uh, who referred to us, she had two previous attempts to remove his scar pregnancy, total blood loss, three liters, and this is what we found. She had a massive, large, dilated blood vessel on the right-hand side, perfusing small amount of pregnancy tissue. We decided to embolize her because putting suction keratin in this uterus would just suck masses of blood within seconds. Embolization was done, partially successful, but still a very large amount of blood coming into the uterine cavity. So in that case, we decided to do something which we haven't done before. We did uh, ultrasound guide laparoscopy, we identified blood vessels, the surgeon was palpating with the instrument side of the uterus until he compressed the blood vessel which fed, fed the pregnancy. We told them, here's the place, the suture was put in and bleeding was stopped and then evacuated tissue in an avascular field. So sometimes in scar pregnancy, you have to be prepared to look for unusual solutions, but, but logic and common sense usually work. What is the risk of leaving tissue behind? Not very high. About 9% of our women had a, a retained products after, after evacuation. I must say some of them were 12, 14, 15, 16 weeks as pregnancy and only 7, 4% require for intervention. So most of the small amount of tissue will resolve spontaneously 
without need for further treatment. Is it worth doing it? Is it worth selling the uterus? What is going to be outcome in the future? Many years ago, we published the first paper by Jara Benagi showing that risk of scar pregnancy recurrence is 5%. I've been collecting data for many years and they remain at exactly the same level. My colleague Jackie Rosson King, who does a lot of scar pregnancy, has the same rate. So I was quite surprised to see Timo Trich reporting 34% recurrence rate, which would be very worrying for me. But it just says that uh, uh, his results are based on meta analysis. That when we say scar pregnancy, we don't all think the same. And I think a lot of scar pregnancy, which are classified this meta analysis as, as being problematic, I would probably not call scar pregnancies myself. Just to summarize my, my, my talk, this is the management protocol we use in our hospital for many, many years. It hasn't changed because it works. I'm still here. I have no medical legal cases. And none of my patients died. It was one hysterectomy out of 350 cases. So if cesarean sexual scar is, is complete, we will manage its local methotrexate below 10 weeks. If it's bigger than that, it's actually an abdominal pregnancy. A pregnancy is a broad ligament. So if you want to tackle it, you have to treat it as you would treat any abdominal pregnancy. If it's a partial, you'll consider surgery. If pregnancy is small, or if it's failed, but it's avascular, usually simple evacuation without any additional procedures enough, often in an outpatient setting using MVA. If pregnancy is larger and it's vascular, we need evacuation with Chiraca suture. As I said before, in very large pregnancy, we have also embolization of standby in case of leaking artery into the uterine cavity. More than 70 weeks, uh, we haven't tackled yet, I think we need to think about that, but at the moment we say it's too late. I have no confidence I can save the uterus. Good luck, and hopefully you have a baby and uterus at the end, although this is not the most likely outcome. So when not to operate the scar pregnancy, well, women do not want to have operation, when you can't access pregnancy transfer generally, you have retained products which are very small. If you're not sure about diagnosis, or if there is a lack of expertise in ultrasound guided procedures. You shouldn't be doing it unless you know how to use ultrasound in theater. Why to like it scar pregnancy? Well, it's effective. It gives you fast recovery. Risk complication is generally low. And fertility is preserved. Thank you for listening. Devo, excellent. You didn't let us down as usual. So thank you for for going through that and 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 uh, presenting a very didactic talk and a very clear vision and and your strong feelings come across really really very palpably can i just clarify some things because i may have missed it and, and surgical evacuation everyone's very familiar with and very comfortable with because they do that in their daily practice but there are clear differences in what you do right because first of all you are conducting i've seen you scan Yes, you're not your average gynecological scanner. You are conducting a ultrasound guided evacuation, correct? Yes. Okay, and the second thing is, it wasn't clear to me, but were you putting just one suture or were you putting two sutures, one below and one above? Now, I will, I'll always put one suture, and in, in the vast majority of cases, this is enough. Only if suture is not achieving complete occlusion, if blood is coming to the cervix, I will occasionally put another suture. But again, the last 20 years, there were only two occasions when I put two sutures. So it's very, very rare. I was just trying to explain what to do if you, if you have a problem. If you're stuck okay. and the suture is in place and it's bleeding. But normally okay. it's one suture okay. in most cases. Lovely. You, you gave a very, let's give one more question, Aris, and then you can open it to the floor. Well, you gave a very clear, you know, I'm so used to you. A very clear didactic message. You know, below eight weeks, it's okay. Above eight weeks to sixteen weeks, you need a real surgical expertise, etc. And, and I think that's absolutely right. But here's my problem: uh, what if it's seven weeks, but it's a type four vascularity? It's hugely vascular. Are we still okay to do just a surgical evacuation? Or what if it's nine weeks and there's absolutely no vascularity? Would it not still be okay? Have you got that computer model in your brain to tell you which is okay and which is not? And is that easily transferable to another unit? When you talk about weeks, you have to be very careful. Yeah, real. Week, week means one thing in light pregnancy, another thing in pregnancy which is not alive. And in early pregnancy, pregnancies which are alive tend to be easier to manage. They must probably tend to be less. All alive, all alive. 
compared to compared to miscarriage, it's actually vascular. So actually, pregnancy is going to give you headache in early early first few weeks. Are those which are failing and look very vascular? Yes, there are exceptions to the rule. So you shouldn't just run into 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 procedure. And I said the main factor apart from gestational age is vascularity. This data I collected a few years ago. And the, I showed you one case of seven weeks pregnancy, which actually was very problematic. So, so if you are planning to do uh, evacuation, if it's a live pregnancy, if it's less than eight weeks, and if it's not very vascular, I think you can do it. And majority of them happen not to be. But, but what if it's less than eight weeks, but it's very vascular? In that case, I would suggest that you either use the like a suture or to send somebody else, yes. Okay, so you, you think vascularity is more important than eight weeks in an ongoing pregnancy? At any stage. You had pregnancy 12 weeks, which are cool. removed without any blood so, loss. So that, so that algorithm you presented at the end, we must qualify it. It's trumped yeah. by vascularity. Yes. I mean, and I didn't... Guarantee. Because when you look at lacuna as a part of the study, you will see that they also contribute to blood loss. But I just try to simplify things for the... For the for the for, for the last yeah, there's always years every 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 problem of course. Okay, Aris, do you do you have anything from the global? Davor, I have a, a couple yeah a couple of uh, sort of general questions. There's a lot of talk of methotrexate. People putting slides up very quickly on methotrexate. Are we talking here about systemic methotrexate, or are people talking about local injection of methotrexate? And what are the what are the pros and cons or differences between the two? It depends on the expertise. You know, it's uh, if 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 you're running early pregnancy, and you're an expert. You should be able to do a local injection of pregnancy. And I learned that because Timur was first to this, to say if you manage a sadaka pregnancy, you should inject local methotrexate. And he was right. Why local methotrexate? Because you give 25 milligrams methotrexate, which I think it's actually too many. You can give five or ten. It's enough. And with the same methotrexate, I had women having a uh, problem with the with the with the, with the um, Liver function had women had women who was paralyzed of systemic trexate, couldn't walk for a month. I thought I finished in my medical practice. With local injections, I never had a problem because it is women are absolutely fine. There's no effect on the on the blood results, and it always works. But systemic trexate, particularly if you have light pregnancy, is touch and go. So I stopped systemic trexate 20 years ago and I never looked back. And then a couple more technical questions. So you put the, the, this suture in, and uh, uh, Tommaso uh, Binardi is asking from, from Italy, but does this not act like a, is it not just plugging the, the cervix? Do you not just cause a hematometra behind it and you just don't see the bleeding? Uh, how, yeah. how, does this, how does this help? But that's the desired effect. The desired effect is to cause hematometra, which exert compression on the, on the uterine vessels. And stop the bleeding. You use, you use bleeding in the cavity as a means of stopping the bleeding. So it's not, you're not occluding cervical artery, it's an artery. No, no, no. You tamponade. You're, just, you're, 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 using, you're using the bleeding as a type of tamponade in a way, instead of a balloon, which would not get into that cavity because it's of irregular shape, etc. But also, you take cavities, if you have a, a uterus without my material, if you try to inflate the balloon, you can inflate it as, as, as much as you like, because there's no resistance there. So, so using balloon, I always found slightly logical, because I always thought, I want uterus to contract, I want uterus to be smaller, I don't want uterus to... Davo, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go on to, to Ilan now, but I want you to think about something. If blood is causing tamponade to stop bleeding, why can't the balloon also do the same thing? But don't answer that now, we're going to come back to that in a, in a second. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I know Roshan, that I, Roshant has one question about okay. okay. no, uh, because because you are saying that the suture McDonald's or Shirodkar can we use now? There are there are a lot many cervical uh, caps which are available to prevent the preterm birth. Can we put it just just cap on the cervical? It, it will work exactly the same without making any intervention with the Marcellin tape or any any local intervention. This is without any intervention. You you are you are just plugging the cervical canal. That's what we need. Like the, the Arab intestine, right <laughs> there without this. It's a good suggestion. Uh, it's, it's it's something which is perhaps worth trying. And I, I haven't used cut before. When I find something which works, I don't change it very easily. But now you mentioned it. I it's worth looking at this because uh, the only question for me is. Is like a cavity strong enough to contain the blood in the uterine cavity. That's all. But uh, 
Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, it's good good alternative. Yeah, we have we have one one of the good picture on our UOG journal before a couple of months where they were showing a cervical pessary, which one I think one of the Israel company has has formulated one uh, 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 this kind of cervical cup, which has got three or four different connections on the cervix. You have to plug in one, two, three, four, and it's going to block from all four or five edges. So that's what we need, and without any intervention, we can put it. We can put it for four hours, six hours, and then we can remove it. So without any hesitation, we can do it as as and as we 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 want. There you are. There we have a live innovation, global innovation in in one from India to London via Croatia. We're we're sorting this. <laughs>